Okay, guys, thanks for coming. So the best presentation we have is to have uh, uh, Maharaja uh, Banika from the Dean's Group. And before the presentation, uh, let me uh, briefly introduce uh, the speaker today. Uh, so Mataza Banaga is a PhD student in the Bradley Department of Electrical of and uh, Computer Engineering at Virginia Tech. He received his bachelor's degree and the master's degree in Computer Communication Engineering from the University of Tehran, uh, Iran in 2012 and 2014. Uh, his current research interests include UAV and the Jones communications, uh, stochastic geometry, and the virus communications. So, without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Speaker. Hello, everybody. Uh, so, my name is Mr. Kaza. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, drone, drone networks, and mobility modeling in drone networks. Uh, so, the title of my presentation will be Performance Recommendation of Known Probability Modeling in Drones Over Networks. It's a joint work with my advisor, Dr. So first, uh, we'll talk about the outline. <laughs> At first, we'll talk about the background and the motivation behind this work. And then we will go over the system model for drone solar networks. We will uh, technically talk about spatial setup and mobility and service model in our system. Then we will go over the performance analysis, uh, which entails uh, the characterization of the point process of interferers, uh, plus uh, the characterization of the thermal building models, such as random we will then talk about simulation results to verify the analysis, and then finally we will go over the uh, future works of the uh, future. So, personally, drone, uh, drones have come into the picture a lot, as most of you guys know, and it has a lot of uh, beautiful use cases. So, I just highlighted four of them here. Uh, the first one would be a disaster management whenever a uh, microwave station is at then drones can be uh, can be implemented very easily and very fast, and because of their because of their flexibility. The other use case could be uh, could be of drones to act as rain, to act as relays, so, so that the, to extend the coverage of a microwave station to far fields. And the other one could be a temporary access for like whenever there is a big event like a sports game or a social gathering or whatever. Uh, then because <laughs> drones can be uh, sort of uh, employed very quickly, then they can be used here as well. And the final example here could be just a localization that, that they can be used to localize uh, different models. So the point that uh, why uh, we are very interested in the drone technology is that the industry is also working. And here comes the money. So, very recently, SurgeGP has added some technical reports in order to support uh, the use of UAVs and drones as UVs or, or space stations. Uh, there are two technical reports here, at least here. And, uh, for, and another example from a company that is actually using drones as space stations is this Altros that is launching some aerial sub towers. It's happening actually. Uh, so the most important features, so we first uh, need to see how different uh, these uh, drone solar networks are from the actual solar networks that we have here. So first of all, they are mobile, so it's, it's a very new feature that the base station can do. This was not uh, happening before. And they have a very high probability of line of sight, because they're in the sky, there's very little blockage, and they're very easy. And so, among these features, so mobility is the one that is very completely new and uh, needs to be taken care of very carefully. So, uh, next in the next slide, I'm going to talk about uh, the two different directions towards uh, uh, analyzing drone networks recently, uh, which we can characterize them, which we can sort of dichot dichotomize them into two sections, which are static and mobile drone networks. So there has been a multiple number of works that have been done in static drone networks. Um, so for example, in this uh, paper, this seminal work for the optimal algorithm to gain maximum coverage has been <coughs> a drive. Or for example, in another seminal work five, the authors uh, sort of 
considered a finite network of drone based stations and uh, modeled as a binomial uh, point process and they derived the uh, coverage property of the network. And finally, in six, the coexisting of the VSS and the actual VSS uh, are being uh, characterized. <coughs> in mobile drone networks, there are much fewer works. So, for example, the, uh, the seven, seven, German 7 is the one that I just talked earlier. That there should be a report that they are considering a straight line mobility model, upward mobility of drones in the network. They're doing some measurements of that. Uh, uh, for example, the Canyon 8, uh, there is uh, an analysis on the design of a drone. <coughs> there are some algorithms uh, for improving the spectral efficiency of the drone network. And finally, uh, in this uh, work at 9, uh, this is like the <coughs> most important work here. Is, uh, um, it, it is just like a three-dimensional uh, modeling of mobility um, in a drone network, and they analyzed different mobility models at random model and waypoint, and they <coughs> and computed the coverage probability of the network. So, um, so because of the random uh, locations of the drones and their random movements, in general, uh, we can consider stochastic geometry as a powerful tool that, could, that can help us uh, <coughs> This sense. So, uh, basically, the stochastic geometry uh, sort of uh, considers consider each drone as a point and those distribution um, mathematical distribution in that to, 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 to these points, and which is very suitable uh, for modeling drone networks. So, one question: So, is there any way that the stochastic geometry can capture the mobility of the drones? I know, I know, I know, drones can. Can be modeled as a points, right? exactly. But yeah, you know, so the mobility. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're doing. Okay. So okay. the mobility can be used. So stochastic geometry can be used to model this mobility as well. So okay. we have a mobility model, and we analyze this model based on stochastic geometry. Mm. Uh, so our spatial setup is like that. So all the drones are at the same height, and we have a lot of views on the ground, which are again distributed based on some point process. So we assume that the uh, drones at, at height h are distributed as a point process, uh, Poisson point process, uh, which is which we assume that it's homogeneous. And we again we assume that uh, there is not a point process on the ground which is even homogeneous. Um, so we assume that the nearest uh, drone to the to the typical UE is our serving drone base station. And then all other the all other UEs, all other and UAVs and drones are considered as interfering matrices. Now we are talking about the mobility models. So we first consider the, our first mobility model is the straight line mobility models. Uh, this is also inspired by Sir GPT, as I thought, as I said before. In this model, each drone uh, chooses a random direction and moves uh, towards that direction without any stop, with, with the same constant speed. In the second model, which we call the random stop or RS, it is similar to the SL mobility model, but uh, each UAV or DBS stops at a random location. They don't stop at the same location, but they stop at random locations. In our uh, two next uh, models, two mobility models, we can see a random walk and random waypoint. So in these models, uh, each UAV, in the random walk, let me first talk about random walk. In the random walk, uh, each UAV selects a random direction moves a random distance based on some distribution in that distance. Uh, and upon reaching that location, then it selects another uh, direction and distance, and then continues and repeats this procedure. In the random waypoint, the same procedure happens, uh, but the only point is that they will stop at a random waiting time in the stop points. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the service and channel model. So we are assuming the nearest neighbor association policy, as I said before. Uh, we will consider two service models for the serving DBs. So for the mobility of the serving DBs. We first assume that the serving DBS also moves in random directions as the all other DBSs, which we call it UE dependent model, or UIM. Or we assume that it's a UE dependent model, which means that uh, the serving DBS moves towards the UE of interest, and then it stops at that location and hovers over here to serve this 
uh, specific EV. This is what we are dating, for both serving and to be and things. And this is our SIR term, um, which uh, the numerator is the SIR signal, the denominator is the sum of the two interviews. So in the performance analysis, the metrics that we consider is the average rate, as seen by the typical EV, which is by the channel rate that we all know, it's the expectation of the log of 1 plus SIR. And this expectation is average over the whole point process and all the temperatures. So this result that I've uh, written here is the typical, is the sort of uh, fundamental result that is available for Nakagami and Beidi. It's nothing new. Uh, and this is like the, this is the Laplace transform of interference that we are going to characterize that using the, uh, the density of the network of interferers that you're talking about. So basically we are uh, so basically we are down to computing so to analyze this setting we are uh, set to down to analyze uh, the density of the network of interferers. And we define session rate as well as a sum as the sum of the uh, average rate of the uh, so in order to characterize that lambda or the density of the network, we need to, consider, we need to characterize the interference limit. So we first uh, present a theorem from stochastic geometry, which is a famous one, which is called the which is called displacement theorem. Um, so displacement theorem says that um, if you have a PPP, a homogeneous PPP, and all the points, and you move all the points independent from each other, then the resulting point at each time will remain a PPP with the same density. But you have to remove all the points. If you remove, if you displace one of the points in a specific manner, then the network will not become a homogeneous. So basically, in the UIM, using that result, uh, we see that uh, the network of interfering DBSs will become homogeneous. And this will be the result for the UIM. However, for the UDM, much more, much, much work will be done. So, in, so basically, in this figure, uh, you can see that the certain DBS, so this is a pop field. The certain DBS moves towards the UE, which is, which is this one, this blue line. So we can see that in this uh, red zone, no interferer, no interferers can enter. We should call this, ex this zone as exclusion zone. And uh, so using this exclusion zone uh, idea, we computed uh, the density of the network at this equation, which you can see here. Uh, so, this equation requires us to compute these two CDF and PDFs, which are, um, which we will discuss about them more, but to just give you some hint, this LT, that, this L that is shown here, is the net displacement of an interfering EBS uh, uh, until time t. So, whatever movement it, it goes, until any time t, what is the distribution of this distance? This would be LT. So next, what we are going to do, we are going to talk about all four mobility models and uh, derive this lambda problem. So in the SL, the density of the interferers is very simply uh, derived as close from here. Uh, so in the SL mobility model, this distribution of the ending point to, <coughs> to the origin is uh, simply just a delta function. So we can easily compute this lambda. We also plot this lambda here. <coughs> Um, so, which you can see, as time goes by, the density tends toward uh, the black line over there, which means that the density is becoming homogeneous. So, basically, that aqua sine term over there uh, is tending towards zero. They're tending, tending toward one. So, one interesting result that we got was that using calculus of variations, uh, we proved that the the simplest survival mobility model is like a lower bound to all other IAD mobility models. Which means that if all the other, if all the UAVs are moving uh, based, on, uh, based on some mobility models, which we assume that these models are, uh, these movements are independent of each other, uh, then the performance would be better than the SL mobility model. Basically prove that the expected number of interferes in any neighborhood of the typical UAV is maximized over the SL which means that the performance would be uh, worse. 
So next we are going to talk about the random walk and random wait in the models. I'm not going to bother you about uh, whatever what I'm doing here, but uh, just to get a sense of what's happening. So these these two these two figures are like the movements, the, the general movements of um, of a DBS based on random walk or random waypoint. Um, there's only three variables which are important for me here. One is the SN, the sum of the distance in the ground so far, and ZN, uh, the net displacement of the distance in the ground. And of the, the same, we have to find for example, ZN. So those, there are some properties of random or random waypoint. Uh, so if our distances traveled are based on are, uh, are based on some really random variables, then the variable ZN, which was the net displacement, is again will be, will be arranged. Exactly. But if RIs are general non radio random variables, then the resulting model will not be rainy. However, uh, it will tend to become a rainy as we increase the number of iterations, number of runs. And the distribution of SN, as you all know, the sum of n random variables is not known in general for, the, for uh, any general distribution. However, there are some approximations for SN when uh, the sum ends are rainy. Um, so, one important point here to, to compute the distribution of the net displacement is that uh, this S and Z and random variables are not, are not independent. So, they depend to each other. And, but however, for large values of N, we can assume that they are independent. But we have derived uh, the, their dependency as well, uh, which I will refer to the paper. So, I'm not going to talk about that more, but I will give you some insights. So, um, these are like the PDFs of uh, this distribution. distribution. So you see they have some ugly shapes, but as time goes by, they will become, they will tend to become uh, a really random value. What is y-axis? Y-axis? Yeah. Just speed them. Probably. Distribution. Frequency of frames. We're going to talk about the simulation results. Um, so I showed you the density of interference for the uh, SL uh, straight line mobility model, which was uh, try, which was tending to become homogeneous. And now in the RS mobility model, which uh, the UAVs stop at some location, uh, we see a different behavior. Uh, that the, sort of when all the UAVs are stopping, the density of the network is not progressing much. So they it will stop at some point. It will stop. Changing at some point, so and it will not become much. All the UAVs are going to stop at the same point. So all the UAVs are going to stop at some point, right? Uh -huh. So the density is first like this, then it will be like this purple one, then this one, then this black one. So you can see that this is not progressing towards up the up in the uh, if I in the figure to, to become homogeneous. By homogeneous, I mean it has a constant. So, if, so it, will, it, will, it will be different, obviously, because we are talking about uh, distributions. You can have with a very low probability, you can go with very high values. But the point is that at some point, there's no progress. The evolution of this point process. Uh, but uh, for the random walk or random waypoint, uh, since the network is always evolving, we see this evolution here as well. So, as time increases, we see that this density is again changing. So as time goes to infinity, so the network will become homogeneous. Uh, so next we consider the impact of fading and height. So um, so we all know that from wireless communication that in Nakagami and fading, as M increases, the severity of the fading will decrease. Right? So which means that as the severity of the fading decreases, then we should expect better performance. So we can see this also here, that by increasing the value of M, uh, the average rate of the network will also increase. We also see this, in, by, uh, we also see this uh, uh, improvement in the rate when we decrease the height. So when, when the height is also decreased, we also see some improvement in the rate. So the basic curve is increase first and decrease a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, this one. 
I mean, all the curves. Oh, the curve themselves, so yeah. they're saturating, obviously, yeah. So, which means that as time goes by, the rate will be saturated. So, okay. we will ultimately get some rate. So, we will not get some very high rates. Okay, so you're going to increase. Yeah, so yeah. there is a increase. Exactly. So, that's a good point. So, there is a slight decrease in the instantaneous rate. But we okay. don't see this in the average rate. Okay. Average, I mean, average over this time. So the reason there is there is an increase here. There is an increase. Yeah, there yeah, is yeah. a small uh, okay. increase here. Um, yeah. And oh, by the way, uh, so these these are all for the UDM model that we discussed. That the serving DBS is moving towards us, towards the uh, towards the um, towards the U. But in the UIM, we can see there is no improvement. So in the UIM, all the points are moving. So basically, the rate is the independent product. Uh, for the, so we can see this as well. This this rate and the session rate uh, for all the mobility models. So this blue dotted line is the theoretical stuff for the mobility model, which you can see that now this is the lower bound of all the other on all the other three uh, models that we discussed. So we are claiming that. This is also true for all the other IAD programs. And uh, we can also see that the, the RS mobility model is sort of acts as a buffer bound. However, we could not prove that, but we just saw that by simulations. And the right figure is the session rate, which is which is nothing but the average over average of this figure over time, which you can again see that this is also saturated. So uh, now I'm going to talk about a bit about the future course. So we have some uh, initial results on the handover probability of the drug solar network. So basically, <coughs> if I want to uh, describe this to you, so in usual solar networks, there are some static BSs and there is a UE which is moving in some direction or in some manner. Then you compute the handover probability or handover rate, which means that how often uh, this UE is changing from one BS to another. In the <coughs> sorry, in a UAV network, all the points, all, all the UAVs, which are the base stations, are moving, and you want to see the effect of uh, this handover on a single static UE on the ground. Do you see the different behaviors? So. Uh, so we proved that. Um, so first, uh, let me show you this. Yeah. So this is the handover probability, the probability of occurrence of the first handover, which is the time uh, uh, of, of the SL mobility model, the first mobility models, uh, in a terms of learning. So same setup, just the SL mobility models, what is the handover probability? How often uh, this rate is going to change? So, as you can see, as time goes as time goes by, uh, the handover probability will definitely be, be increased, and as the intensity uh, and the density of the network also increases, so the points are denser. Again, the handover probability should be increased. And in this plot, uh, we're again showing the handover probability for two different the models. Uh, the blue one is the same speed model, which we assume that again the points are moving based on the SL mobility models and they are having the same speed. In the red one, we are assuming they are all having different speeds based on some uh, probability distribution. And very interestingly, you can see that uh, the probability of occurrence of the first handover initially is higher in different speeds, but <coughs> it uh, becomes lower in different speeds. So, Concluding this talk, we analyze the performance of the mobile drone solar network in the various mobility models, and then we propose two service models for the serving DBS, for the movement of the serving DBS, and we characterize the point process of interferes uh, for both of these service models, and we finally demonstrate that, that uh, the 3GPP inspired uh, this SL storyline mobility model is act acting as a lower bound of performance of other uh, mobility models. So you can find these two talks in the Google Docs as well. I just mentioned it here. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions?
questions? Coming back to his question, I didn't still completely understand why it was not monotonic. The red behavior. Yeah, yeah. If we did not see any reason what was the reason. We did not find any reason why this happened. So there is a very small. Uh, so this is small is being done. It is happening in only the cases when all the points are moving constantly. So in the RS mobility model, in the, just in that uh, green curve, we do not see this behavior. I still don't know why this happened, but there's a very small degradation. So which means that if you want to, I mean, you will get the best uh, uh, best rate in this time, for example. After that time, uh, there's not much so Any other questions? What channel model? The channel model? So we considered macromomium fading for the fading, and we did not consider the noise because of. Uh, so there were two reasons for not considering noise. One was for tractability, uh, the other was that. So we considered noise in our conference paper. So the first one here. And we showed that the effect of noise is very minimal. So this is a very interference limited scenario. Uh, so, yeah, assume like all the UAV is going to be flying on the same height, right? Yeah, so there's a probability of collision. Yeah, there's a probability of collision. Cause, cause yeah, so, so this is, so first of all, let me tell you something. This is a, just a simplistic model, so we're not going to solve all the problems. Yes. <laughs> so, but, uh, so this is sort of, so we can justify the different ways. Uh, so. We are assuming them to be points, so two points in a point pro in a single point process cannot be at the same location. But right. this is just for mathematical mm -hmm. attractability. In, a, in another way, you can sort of assume that if two, so there are a lot of the things happening between the, these UAVs. There are a lot of other communications between the UAVs themselves. So you can maybe assume that if two if two UAVs are going to collide, one of them can change the x height just for one meter or so, and then okay. continue at, at that. Rate. So I'm not saying that we have to insist on the same height, but having the same height will ease the sort of facilitating the analysis very much. And if, if, if you have like multiple heights, this will, this will complicate the analysis, and again, collision can happen. Okay. So for that, you can do like another sort of point process, maybe a hardcore point process that you're saying that like the points, space, right? Exactly. So points do not touch by a meter. So. So you, did, you did consider the height like the parameters within the model. Sorry, but sorry? You, you did consider the height, like a, for example, a, a different UAV flying different uh, yeah, heights. Yeah, we did not consider that. So okay. as I told you, it, this will complicate the analysis. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Definitely. Do you consider any non-line of sight? No, no. We are we are considering. So basically, what we are considering is uh, we are not dividing it for line of sight. Line. So this can also be done, but there are a lot of, it, it should be, so there are some technicalities here. So when we are separating all the UAVs, sort of giving giving them a probability of having the line of sight and non line of sight, this is sort of dichotomize the, two, the UAVs into two regions. And then computing this lambda, this density of the network, when you dichotomize that, it's not that straightforward. So it's not like just, by multiplying this with the probability and blah blah blah. So yeah, th this can also be done, but maybe in more simplified, simplified and maybe more simplified mobility models. Any other questions? What is the impact of handover? Impact of handover. So, uh, so handover is really not a good thing. Because if you have a lot of handovers, it has its own overhead. It will cause it. It may fail. So there is a handover failure rate that we should we should try to minimize that. So, but uh, using these analytical results, we are saying that okay, if you are in this region, we have a low probability of handover. And if handover occurs, then the performance will be degraded. Because there will be more latency because of the overhead of the signals trans transmitting between different uh, UVs and BSS.
No questions? So, so let's thank the speaker again for the great <laughs> Thank you guys.